Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here again, two weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row of faces looking back. Um, I don't know if I'll ever get over that again, right? The goodness of being able to see faces and expressions, um, it's a good thing. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, in which we remember those who, who gave their lives for us to live free in this country. And so if any of you, probably a lot of you have family members who were, uh, gave their lives in military service for our freedoms, we thank you on behalf of them. Um, and we pray that we all have a, a blessed Memorial Day tomorrow. I want to pray now and open our time before we start digging into God's Word. Lord, our prayer this morning is to you. We come to you because of the abundance of your steadfast love. We come to you because of your faithfulness to save us. We ask, Lord, that you will deliver us from our sinful tendencies, that you will work in us to will and to work according to your good pleasure in our daily life. Our enemy is sin. And so we ask that you would deliver us from the sin that threatens us daily. Let us hear your answers through your daily deliverance and providence. Help us to not feel alone, but to be swaddled in your presence. Hear our cries of distress and draw near to us. Lord, you know, you know us. You know us more intimately than we know ourselves. You know exactly what we need. And we ask that you would draw near to us in our needs. And deliver us from any want we may have that is not your will for our life. If, if anyone in this room or under the sound of my voice has lost the joy of their salvation, I pray that you would restore it to them in abundance. All of us can go higher in our joy in you. All of us can go deeper in our knowledge and understanding of who you are and how you act on our behalf. Lord, you love righteousness. So let our love for your righteousness grow and deepen and be strengthened. Be our rock of refuge. May our running to you increase in speed. May our feet be swift to run to you because you are our fortress, O oh Lord. Lord, if you were to mark iniquity, who could stand? Thank you for the precious blood of Christ that washes us whiter than snow. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning and endure forever. May our hope this morning be set fully on your grace that we have been given in Jesus Christ. Your righteousness reaches the heavens. You have done great things, O oh God. Who is like you? There is none like our God. You and you alone are God. May we worship you this morning in the splendor of your glory. And we ask that you would attend your word this morning and stir our hearts to love and good works. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let me read verses 13 through 25 of 1 Peter 1. We're still in 1 Peter chapter Chapter, well, chapter, well, excuse me, we're in chapter 2 now. We're in chapter 2. How about that? Yeah. Finally. Let me read chapters two, chapter 2, 1 through 3. Excuse me. It, Peter says this, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. I want to reconnect some commands here. That's why on my mind it was uh, chapter 1 still. I want to reconnect some commands here in order for us to understand the context of what Peter's saying here in chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. 
Chapter 2 starts in your translation, probably so or therefore, um, depending on your translation. <clears throat> and what that tells us is that this is connected to a previous statement or the previous passage. So what he's about to say is connected to what he's already stated. So 1 Peter 2, 1 is connecting back actually to verse 22. And I want to show you this by reading uh, verse 22 through 25 um, and through chapter 2, verse 3. It says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away, or therefore, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, what Peter does here is in verse 23 through 25, he inserts, um, I don't want to call it an interruption because it's the inspired word of God, but it, it, he, he inserts verses 23 through 25. And why does he insert that? Well, remember from the last two weeks, Peter inserts verse 23 to teach us how we are able to obey God and love God and love one another, right? He, he tells us that we have consecrated ourselves, right, by obedience to the truth, and we have this brotherly love for one another, and then he commands us to love one another uh, earnestly from a pure heart. And then he, verse 23 says, since you have been born again, right? This is why you've consecrated yourself. This is why you're obedient to the truth. This is why you have a brotherly love for one another. And this is why you can obey the command to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Because you've been born again. Because you've been made of imperishable seed. And then Peter quotes Isaiah um, in verse 24 uh, and 25. The reason Peter quotes Isaiah is because if we do not know, if we do not know that our salvation is secure in the perfect obedience of Christ, if we were to think that our salvation was secured by our own obedience, then hiding away in a cave makes sense. If we're honest with ourselves, if, 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 if the gospel was your sins are forgiven, now do a good job. Sin no more, right? Would you not want to, if you really understand salvation, if you really understand what hell and damnation is, you would want to remove yourself from every temptation that you could think of. And so he, Peter doesn't want us to hide away. He doesn't want us to try to remove ourselves. There are, there are people who do that. There's movements that remove themselves from society to remove temptation. It doesn't, but it that's the thought behind it. And Peter doesn't want us to hide away. He doesn't want to try to remove us to remove ourselves from temptation or opportunity to sin. Because in that mode of thought, your salvation is based upon your ability to be good. If, if the gospel was your past is clean, now the security of your et eternal future is up to you, I would most likely disengage from all society altogether. Just to give me a fighting chance. And it really wouldn't be, but you get what I'm saying. I would, I would bubble wrap myself, right? And bubble wrap my family and try to keep us from being exposed to to the society that doesn't believe in God and suppresses the truth and unrighteousness. I would go to all kinds of lengths to bubble wrap my family, hoping that it would somehow foster us into righteousness. That's what kind of thinking is behind that, that, that thought, the removing yourself. But that whole train of thought is unbiblical. It's in opposition to the gospel, and so Peter doesn't want us cowering in a corner, afraid to live the Christian life. He doesn't want us locking ourselves away in fear of the world dirtying us up. And he reminds us by this quote of Isaiah 
that our salvation is secure and it is complete. That security is completely based on the promises of a good God who cannot tell a lie. Right? It's completely based on put your faith in Jesus Christ and the covenant between God and man has been kept for you and the penalty for your sin has been completely taken up and paid for by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So what I want to do is I want to read verse 22 and then skip to verse 1 so that I can reconnect the context and the commands so that we can better understand what Peter's saying in verse 1 through 3. Read verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. And here's the imperative. Here's the command. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Verse 1. So, therefore, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. You see how that's connected. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Therefore, put away these next five attitudes and behaviors that I'm going to describe that we all struggle with, right? If you want to love one another earnestly from a pure heart, then you're going to have to be active in putting these things away in your life. And there are five behaviors that are listed here that must be removed. We must engage in the battle against them daily in order for us to obey the command to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So I want us to look at these five behavioral expressions individually and prayerfully, right? Whenever we're studying the Word of God, we're, we're not just wanting to get head knowledge. We're wanting that to sink to our hearts. So we have to ask God, God, take what I'm hearing and what your Word says and help it to sink into my heart. Help it to, to move me, change me, stir me. So let's ask, as, we, as we're looking at these, these are all attitudes and behaviors that we all struggle with. And so let's ask God, show us, show us how these are alive in our hearts. What area of my life may these be alive? What relationship is there in my life where these may be alive? And help me to repent of them for your honor, right? We need to repent of these daily. We need to seek to avoid them daily. daily. And I want us to remember that what comes out of us is what's in us. It's what Jesus says. And I want to explain this a, a, with a little more detail. So I want, to, I want to actually take us to where Jesus says this. Because there's a few things that I want to say that will, I hope, undergird what we look at the rest of the morning. Matthew 15, 18, and 19. Matthew 15, 18, and 19. If, if you don't know these verses, underline them, bookmark your Bible, and read it this way. Jesus is saying this about me, all right? Real easy for me to read these verses and say, yeah, I've seen it in you, all right? I, I've seen people like this. No, this is, Jesus is saying this about all of us. He's saying this about all of us. He says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from where? The heart. And this is what defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts and murder and adultery and sexual immorality and theft and false witness and slander. These are what defile a person. This is what's capable of coming out of our heart if we're not actively seeking to obey God's command to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. I want to say a couple of things, a few things um, about what Jesus says here. I've got three points about what Jesus says that are shorter, but I've got sub points too. So I'm not, I just don't, don't pay attention to the numbers. A, couple, a few things here about what Jesus says. Uh, number one, our problem, and hear me on this, <clears throat> because our culture says the opposite. What Jesus is saying here is our problem 
is not our circumstances. Our problem is not our circumstances. Circumstances allow you to express the problem. <clears throat> Jesus was tempted in all points, yet what? Without sin. So our problem is not our circumstances. Our problem is our heart. Circumstances allow us to express what's in us. <clears throat> so, therefore, hiding away does not get rid of the problem. Right? Hiding away does not get rid of the sin problem that we all have. It may, it may lessen the external expression of that specific expression. <clears throat> but it does not less, lessen the expression of the root of sin. I, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Well, for example, as a man, if you remove yourself from ever being around women, right? And, and this goes for women too. If you remove yourself, you go put yourself in a cave and there's no longer people, you will not express your sin in lusting for a specific person. But lust will still be alive in your heart in that cave. You'll lust for something else. The root of sin is still there because the root of sin is where? It's inside you. It's not outside of you. Your problem is not the circumstances. Your problem is your sin nature. Lust is typically an expression of greed. Greed is wanting to have something that you shouldn't have or you cannot have. So you can, you can pluck your eyes out, right? That doesn't gonna, that's not going to remove lust or greed from your heart. If you removed yourself from all mankind, you may never express hatred towards a specific person. Because you're not running into them. Two sinful people aren't rubbing up against each other, right? But hatred for something will continue to express itself. Because hatred is often an expression of self-value being threatened. If you threaten my perceived self-value, then there's going to be anger towards you if I'm not thinking correctly. There are numerous ways... Numerous ways to express the root sin that's going on in our heart. Numerous ways. As John Calvin stated once, our hearts are idol factories constantly pumping out new idols every minute. Now why, why is that important? Because if you want to wage war against sin in your life, and this is what Peter's commanding us to do, if you want to wage sin in a war against sin in your life, which that's what we're commanded to do, Peter's telling us to get rid of all malice, all deceit, right? Hypocrisy, envy, all slander. Get rid of those things. Paul, Paul in Colossians tells us to get rid of, right? To put to death these things and put on, clothe yourselves with these things. So the Christian life is battling against sin, battling against those things that bring harm upon our life and dishonor God. And if you want to wage war against sin in your life, you have to go deeper than just the expression of sin. You have to go deeper than the expression of sin. For example, if you have an, an issue with anger issues, you come home, things aren't like you'd hope they'd be, the house is a mess, supper isn't ready, something's broke that you're going to have to fix, whatever the scenario may be, and you express anger, that doesn't mean anger is the root sin. It's not. Anger is the expression of the root sin. Right? And there's so much cultural um, therapy that says just, you know, put a band-aid on the expression. And, and then what happens is, is that expression may alle alleviate a little bit, but then it just starts expressing itself other, other places. <clears throat> Anger is not the expre expression of the root sin. The root sin could be something like you have an idol in your heart called control. You want to control everything. It's, it's, the, it's the I want to be God in all of us. 
I want to control the scenario. So I'm driving home from work and I have this mindset of what I expect when I walk through the door and when it doesn't happen, now you've just attacked my idol of control and I express the root sin of control with anger. And the world says, let's put a band-aid on anger and never get to the root sin, which is the idol of control or the idol of comfort. You ever been, guys, you ever wanted to watch a football game and you, you got everything planned out and you turn on the TV and then something happens, right? You can't watch the TV, on, TV or internet goes out or cable goes out. You can't watch the game and now you're angry. You get on the phone with customer service and you forget all about the fact that you're a Christian. <laughs> right? Come on now, don't act holy. The, the, anger is not the root sin that we need to be dealing with. What, right then, it's an idol of comfort. I want to sit back, be comfortable, and be entertained, and I've planned for this, and now I'm, my comfort's not here, and neither is my control. And so we express our disappointment in the idol of control letting us down, or the idol of comfort letting us down, and displaying what, my inability, what, what's just been exposed is my inability to control. So anger may be lessened if everyone walks on eggshells to make sure that the home is exactly the way you want it. But anger will still be expressed because we're all sinners interacting with other sinners. And because anger is not the root sin. And nothing is ever going to be 100% the way we want. I could say a lot more, but the, the next point about what Jesus is saying here is how we behave indicates to whom our allegiance is at the time of our behavior. Okay? How we behave exposes where our allegiance is at the time that we express a certain behavior. You have, you know, you have an idol going on when your behavior deviates from, God, oh, from God's will for your behavior. You, how, how, I've been asked this question, how do you know that there's an idol going on? How, how do I know that there's an idol in my heart going on right now and the, and the answer is whenever you act in a way that God would tell you not to act whenever you deviate from God's will for your life whether that is an expression of doing something that you shouldn't or not doing what you should that's when you know that there's an idol in your heart and it's by the way it's all the time When we behave in a sinful way, we are exhibiting that there is an idol that we've allowed to take preeminence in our heart. And as Christians, John Flavel said that the greatest duty of every Christian is to be a student of their own heart. To be a student of your own heart, to recognize sinful behavior and the cropping up of idols in your life so that you can immediately put them to death before they get a stronghold in your life. And so when, whenever we start behaving in a sinful way, we are exhibiting that there is an idol that we've allowed to take preeminence in our heart and we need to be aware of such, immediately starting to search our heart for the root idol that has taken hold of us and start praying and asking God to help us root it out. Thirdly, a behavioral expression, and I, this is important for us to understand, a behavioral expression in a circumstance does not necessarily characterize someone. Okay? I mean, we can, we can give in to temptation, and that doesn't mean that we, could, we should be characterized by that specific giving in. <clears throat> As Christians, it's important to note that just because we act a certain way on a certain occasion does not mean that we are necessarily, necessarily characterized by such a behavioral expression. You could see someone, you could observe someone just absolutely lose it, and maybe, maybe it's just been a really, really tough day. Maybe they just found out that a family member is dying. You, I mean, you just don't know what's going on in that person's life, and maybe that's an uncharacteristic response, but you witnessed the response, and it's easy for us to walk away and characterize that person by that individual response. And so... As Christians, we shouldn't be characterized by sinful behavior. But it doesn't mean that we're not ever going to express it. Right? Let 
But what we do, what we do in the moment reveals our heart in the moment, but it doesn't necessarily characterize our behavior. It's, it's our character if it's habitual. Now, with that in mind, and hopefully without laying some clarifying groundwork here for our understanding of these specific behavioral expressions that Peter states here, I want to look at these five. I want us to look at these five behavioral expressions, keeping in mind what Jesus says there in the passage that we read and then <clears throat> the, the things that we just discussed. The first is, is all malice. He says, so put away all malice. Remember, now, this, in order to love one another earnestly from a pure heart, Peter's saying you have to put these things away. So the first is all malice. This, this word malice means to have an ill will towards someone. To be willing to injure them physically or, and especially, um, emotionally. But more than that, it denotes the attitude of such behavior. So it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not only that you can display malice, it's that you have a vicious disposition, is what Peter's saying here. You, as Christians, we have to get rid of malice in our heart so that we don't have a vicious disposition. And a vicious disposition is one that is really quick to retaliate with vengeance. Right? And that should not be. I mean, James says, be slow to speak. Be slow to anger, right? Because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of, of God. So we don't want to be someone that has the, the, the quickness to be deliberately cruel to others. Our, our response, we have to put malice away so that our response is not one that is constantly seeking to one-up the person that just harmed you. I mean, that, that's, that's the way of the world, right? You, you, we, we've all been on playgrounds before, right? <clears throat> I think that may be the easiest way to see that expression. <clears throat> One kid calls another kid a name. The other kid calls him and his mom a name, right? And then that kid retaliates with a push. And then that kid retaliates with a punch. And it just keeps escalating. Why? Because we are... By our sin nature, we want to one-up people in harm because we have a vicious disposition, and it's called malice. And that's what Peter's saying we have to put away. We, we should not one-up each other in harm. We should forgive, and we should take the brunt of the harm or the offense. That's what, we're, that's what the Bible teaches us. This kind of person would, would seek to harm that person in reputation or to harm them emotionally, to desire to cause them to grieve and hurt. But rather, God calls us to pray. God calls us to pray for those who harm us. Pray for those who persecute us. To bear the weight of the offense and forgive. To see through the actions of others, to see through them and remember whose image they're created in. Right? I mean, what, what, is, what, is, what do movie producers do? If they want you to cheer when someone dies, what do they do? They make that person a villain, right? So that when that person dies, the whole movie, you've been watching the horrible characteristics of this person, and they finally die in the movie, and everybody goes, yeah! Right? Yeah. We're, we're not to be that way. I'm not, I'm not trying to spoil your movie time. But, but we're supposed to stand for love and forgiveness. And no matter what that person does to us, what we're supposed to see is that they're created in the image of God. And our desire for them should be for them to fulfill their purpose in enjoying God and glorifying him forever. Rather than seeking to bring harm. Next, Peter says for us to remove all deceit. This, this means to behave in such a way that you deceive someone by concealing or misrepresenting the truth. Someone who's constantly stretching the truth, constantly using maybe hyperbole in how they say things or, you know, such and such happened and it's exaggerated so it looks like a greater offense or it looks bigger or better than it was. 
misrepresenting something, you know, like an investment. I, remember, I don't know if they still do this, but I'm pretty sure they used to, you know, you, they put sawdust in, in transmissions to make them run smooth for a little while. That's a, that's a deceptive tactic. And Christians aren't to have any deceit in us whatsoever. Everything is supposed to be honest and truthful. And truth doesn't equal opinion, by the way. There should be a great separation between being truthful to someone and just being blunt with your opinion, right? That's not the same thing. We, we are to not have any deceit in us. We're, we're not to misrepresent the truth. We're not to conceal things in order to gain someone's favor. We don't want to misrepresent ourselves in the Christian life. This, this happens so often in churches. And that, that kind of brings us to what Peter says next. He says, remove hypocrisy from our life. This, this could be someone who acts one way at church and completely different away from the church. Someone who pretends to, comes to church and pretends to want to be more like Christ, wants to pretend like they want to be a better Christian, but as soon as they leave that crowd, they act a different way and they no longer have those concerns. This is the, what this word hypocrisy means. Another example of hypocrisy is something and this is something that I, I find so unattractive in churches is someone who acts as if they don't ever struggle. Right? Um, we, we, act, we can act as if we have it all together, that, that there's no need for, for me to be discipled. There's no need for repentance in my life. There's no need for me to learn because I, I'm, I'm there. But the gospel is attractive when we represent ourselves in truth, that we are sinners who have been rescued from our inability to meet God's demands by a Savior who met those demands on our behalf. And that we, we still struggle with sin. We still need to repent daily. We still need forgiveness. And not only the forgiveness of Christ, but the forgiveness of one another. I promise you, if, if we're around together long enough, I will let you down at some point. Because I'm a sinful human being. At some point, there's going to be an expectation maybe that you have on me that I'm not going to meet and I'm going to let you down. Or maybe there's something I should have done and I didn't and I'm going to let you down. And you know why? It's because I'm still a sinner and I'm still in need of forgiveness. And so, sometimes and a lot of times that forgiveness is from relationships. We, we still confess that we, we sin and that we seek forgiveness and reconciliation when it happens. Peter adds to that envy. Envy should have no part in our relationships with one another. This, this is an in, inner behavior that would be jealous of someone's standing, their, their social standing, their economic standing, their, their positional standing. It's, it's, a jealous, it's a jealousy within someone um, of, of maybe a benefit that someone's received. A feeling of discontentment aroused by someone else's possessions or qualities. And, and this, this a lot of times, envy a lot of times is behind an attitude of malice. It's, it's behind uh, malicious behavior a lot of times. Because we get jealous because we're envying someone and then we strike them, right? We want to strike a blow to that person. And, and finally, we're commanded here to remove all slander from our relationships. Slander would fall in place if envy was alive and an attitude of maliciousness was alive and well, too. These kind of work together a lot of times, these behaviors here. Slander is making a false, spoken statement that is damaging to a person's reputation. And we are commanded to get rid of these attitudes and behaviors in our life. There's, there's to be no room in our heart for these kind of behaviors and attitudes. They dishonor the Lord who bought us with his precious blood. They destroy relationships and foster an environment in the church that is hostile, insecure, and usually filled 
with a separation of cliques. Rather than what God's called the church to be, and that is a unified, safe refuge in which all members feel safe and secure when they're here because they know and they feel that they are surrounded by people who love them. Now, I want to get to the root cause of why we have, some of the root causes of why we have these kind of attitudes and behaviors. When we, when we manifest that these five sinful uh, attitudes and behaviors are in our heart, it is because we have fallen into the trap of finding our value in self. I'm, it, is, it is one of the greatest temptations every day that we face is finding our value and identity in self. And when we do, when we fall into the mindset and into the trap of finding our value in self rather than Christ, we start showing signs of malice and envy and deceit and slander and hypocrisy. And when we do that, we have fallen into a self-righteous mindset. And a self-righteous mindset feeds off of puffing up one's ego. That's what a self-righteous mindset does. It feeds off our ego being puffed up. And particularly and especially at the expense of tearing others down. We are constantly trying to build up self-value by tearing down anyone that we feel is competition for the affections and the admiration of our peers. Okay? When, we, when we're acting in these five behaviors, it's because we've fallen into a mindset of finding value in ourself, being in the self-righteous mindset, and anything that threatens our perceived value among our peers, we will tear down in order to lift ourselves up. And this kind of Self-righteous mindset of finding value in self is deadly. It's actually deadly to self. The world feeds on it. That's why you have all these little quarrels all the time among young people. I mean, it still happens to us. We're just better at, like, painting it a different color. But you, you remember going through school, and there, this group's talking about this person and tearing them down, and this group's talking about this person. You can wear the wrong shoes or the color of your shoes aren't cool today, and then all of a sudden you're being torn down. Why? Why do we do that? Because we're trying to lift ourselves up in the eyes of the people around us, and that gives us a perceived but false greater self-value. And so we're constantly tearing each other down. So the reason why we have malice and deceit and envy and slander and hypocrisy is because we have fallen into the mindset of self-value and self-righteousness. It's deadly to self, and it's deadly to our relationships. The gospel calls us to die to self. The gospel calls us to build others up, to love your neighbor as yourself, to want them to be in the spotlight if that's what God has ordained for them, right? Not to be jealous of the spotlight that they're in, and not to try to go behind that spotlight occasion and tear them down so that any admiration that for them that might have been heightened in your peers' eyes is devalued and then you're valued higher. That's, that's what causes this in our life. And if we're not dying to self, if we're not putting sin away, if we're not putting these behaviors away, we can't love one another because we're going to be jealous of each other. And we're going to be jealous of what God's doing in your life. If there's any uh, sense of success in that person's life, we're going to be jealous of it if we're not putting these things away. If we're not finding our value in something other than self. And that's Peter's next point. I only have two points this morning. This is the second one. Instead of finding value in self, what, what, the God, what God calls us to do Right? What God calls us to is to not find value in self because there's none there. 
and find your value in knowing God because all the value's there. All of it. And so he says, put these things away and then do something else. I, I, love, I love how the Bible parents us. It's not just don't do this, right? Because all that does is hype in the flesh, right? Heighten the desire and make us want, what am I missing out on, right? The Bible parents us by saying, don't do this, do this, because this is better for you. This is better for you. And so put these things away and do this. And he says in verse 2 and 3, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, I'll, I'll say more, I think, next time about growing up into salvation and everything, but the, I just want to kind of summarize this. The very definition of growing up into salvation is this. It's growing more in your dependence of Christ for joy and value and identity. Growing up into salvation is growing more in your dependence upon Christ for joy, for value, and for identity. The more aware we become, and I think, I think you would agree with me, the longer we've been a Christian, the longer we've been in the Word of God, the more we start seeing internal sins that, that we don't like. The, the more we see the, the, the potential sinfulness of our own heart. And so the more we study God's word, the more aware we become of our absolute bankruptcy of righteousness outside of Christ, the more we will abandon all efforts of establishing self-value in our reputation, in our possession, possessions, or in our qualities. If you have a good work ethic, that's great. But that's not righteousness. That's not the demand that God requires. He calls us to that, but it's not good enough. If you meet God in judgment and you say, man, I, I have a good work ethic, Lord, guess what? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, if that's all you have. So the more aware we become, and God calls us to be more and more aware of the fact that we are absolute bankrupt of righteousness outside of Christ. And the more aware we become of this, I pray the more that we will abandon all efforts of establishing self-value in our reputation, what people think of us, right? In our possessions that moths eat and rust destroys and thieves steal and in our qualities. Because our qualities compared to the standard, which is Christ, are nothing. And the more we abandon all efforts in establishing value in self, the more we will be able to love others and build them up because we're not constantly running around trying to build our value up in your mind. I'm not running up to Mark and I'm trying to build up my value and what I perceive he thinks of me, right? And if you're honest with yourself, you've had thoughts pop up in your mind when you do something you're good at, and maybe you're like, man, I hope the neighbor sees me doing this. Boy, I'm good at this. Boy, if they only knew that I did this, that, and the other. That, that's temptations for self-value right there, and we all experience it. We need to abandon that and know that our value and our identity and our worth is in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't change. It doesn't go away. It doesn't diminish. It's eternal in its nature and it's infinite in its value. And, and we have this kind of mindset, Peter says, by longing for the pure spiritual milk, which is the word of God that Peter has been describing in depth um, in previous verses. The, the more we feast upon the Word of God, the more we crave the Word of God, like a baby craves milk. What a great example, right? If you've ever had a baby in your house, you know what a baby does when they're hungry. They don't hide it. They crave it. They long for it. They will keep you up all night to let you know that they want it. They crave it. 
And we're to crave the Word of God in the same way. It's instinctive for a baby to crave nourishment. It's instinctive for a baby to crave that which tastes good to their bodies and satisfies their hunger by nourishing them. And the same goes for the Word of God. Physical food may nourish for a while, but Jesus said, Thou shalt not live, what, by bread alone. The Word of the Lord is what truly sustains us into the next life. The spiritual feasting on the Word of God and the nourishment that we gain from the Word of God passes the grave. It passes the grave. It literally grows us into salvation. It transforms us into the image of Christ, the very image that we were created to reflect and the very image that as Christians we will reflect forevermore. So Peter says, long for God's Word. It is perfect in training us in righteousness, right? The Word of God is perfect for training us in righteousness, which means this. You can also say it this way. It is perfect in training us to get rid of unrighteousness. The Word of God is perfect in training us for righteousness, which can also be said it is perfect for training us to get rid of unrighteousness so that we can hide God's Word in our heart that we might not sin against us. I'm going to stop there. Yeah, I'm going to stop there. Think we'll, we'll pick up next time um, on this, this grow up into salvation and verse 3. But I, I, want, I want us to, to think about something. Let me, just, let me just say this. God has called us. We're here. We're in this church. We're a church family. God has called us to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And Peter tells us here some of the behaviors and attitudes that can stand in the way of us loving one another deeply. And I want to say this. Those things will stand in the way of us loving one another earnestly from a pure heart. But, but also, the fear of expressing those things can also stand in the way. We can't be paralyzed. In other words, I read these five behaviors and I'm like, Lord, I know my sinful heart. I could express that at any time given a bad day or given me giving into temptation. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to get around people so that I don't express these behaviors and attitudes and then I'm okay. Right? And then I can keep what I perceive that they think about me there. Right? So not only the these sins expressed towards one another can keep us from loving one another earnestly from a pure heart, but the fear of them can cause us to not hang out with one another and lo not love deeply, and that's just as bad. Because either way, you're disobeying God's command to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And if you, if you surveyed the world, the world would say, I'm just, I'm just okay. Yeah, I mean, if, if wars would end, and if everybody would just treat people civil, then, you know, man, I'm okay. That would be a great world to live in. And God says, not enough. Not enough. Not for my family. Not for my bride. I command my bride to go deeper than that. That the relationships would go deep and the love would be heightened for one another. And that when the world looks at how they behave for one another and bear each other's burdens and are there for one another, the world says, I don't know that, but I want some of it. I, I, I've not experienced that in my relationships. My relationships turn on a dime as soon as someone's perceived value is attacked, they will come at you. And they see a church family that doesn't do that and loves one another deeply through the sinful behaviors that we all express. And the world says, man, I've never experienced that kind of love. I want some of it. And then they come and ask us for the reason, for the hope that we have, right? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that... Not only are we called to love each other deeply, but you are a God and a father who loves their children so deep and so wide and so high that it, it surpasses our complete understanding. We thank you for the love that not only that you have displayed for us throughout the history of mankind,
but also in the greatest yet is the cross of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the redemption that we have. We thank you for the imperishable seed that we are made of, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives within us to work in us both to will and to do according to your good pleasure. And Lord, you call us to love one another more deeply. And so Lord, I pray that we would do so. That our, our church would just exude forgiveness and exude love and compassion and reconciliation and a deep and abiding love for one another, Lord. Make it so, we pray. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.